Hello, listeners of Don't Waste Your Hate and Subversion. I'm joined today by Tony Rockamora of Don't Waste Your Hate. Hey, Tony, how's it going? What's up, Trey? How you doing, man? Good, good. Uh, well, today you have brought to my attention a really great episode of Sam Harris's Waking Up podcast with Christian. What is it, Christian Picciolini? I think it's Picciolini. So yeah, basically, uh, just a rundown of what this is. It's a live podcast, um, and they're recording in front of an audience. There's a Q&A at the end. And Christian Picciolini is a former neo-Nazi. And yeah, I think, you know, when you had first brought this to my attention, I was kind of intrigued by it. Um, and it seemed like you might have had more of a visceral reaction to it than than I did. I think I certainly... You know, I was really taken back by a lot of the things that both of these people were saying. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, what they're saying, there's value in it. But like I was telling you offline, you know, they're, the areas that they're wrong are really, really profound and deeply flawed, in my opinion. And it could lead people to uh the wrong conclusions i think about the nature of society and the nature of humans so i mean why don't you just tell me uh just some of your thoughts overall as to why you had such a reaction to uh this episode okay well um i try not to live in an echo chamber so i do tend to go out and listen to things that are not just my standard libertarian content providers. And Sam Harris is one of these guys. Um, I heard him first on Rogan a while back. And I think Sam Harris has a lot of great things to say. Uh, I, I, especially his um, stuff on religion uh, is very interesting. His, you know, he's, he takes uh, the unpopular stance um, about Islam being uh, inherently uh, a bad thought system. So I've, I like what he has to say about that. Uh, his stuff on free will is also very interesting. I'm not sure if I'm totally on board with it, but I think it's uh, worthwhile conversations to, to listen to. So I, I, sometimes I like what he says, but other times I think he is uh, completely hypocritical and where he is kind of on one hand, totally against this system of religion that controls people. He obviously, to a libertarian, he has a, a serious blind spot when it comes to the role of the state. So I, I, I listen to him, and uh, at some some points I am agreeing, some points I'm not. So I started this episode, and in the first five minutes, I was like, "Oh man, this is going to be good." Like I was really thinking it was going to be a really good episode. Like there was going to be like a, a very honest conversation um about this and I, I thought that i i wasn't expecting to be annoyed by it at all but then um just the 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 change i mean this guy he does some terrible things he talks about in the beginning how he was involved in these in this neo-nazi um group since he was i think about 14 and then he talks about how he had violently attacked um i think Definitely African Americans. I'm not sure if he attacked any anyone who was Jewish, but definitely like physically, like to the point of almost killing a guy at least on one occasion. So I was expecting, um, you know, something very productive to come out of this conversation. And I think there were some good points made, but there was just a lot of it that I just thought was like very hypocritical, a lot of cognitive dissonance, like we mentioned before we started recording. So, you know, at that point, I just. I sent out the link to you and a couple of our other friends in the Libertarian Union just to see if anyone else had listened to it because I was wondering, um, you know, because if anyone had the same kind of reaction that I did. And then I guess you you listened to it and here we are. Yeah, and I had been meaning to subscribe to Sam Harris's podcast, but it's just like I have so many other podcasts and other pieces of media that I'm trying to pay attention to as well. But you know what I should do? I should subscribe and just delete the ones that don't look interesting to me or something like that, because I do find, you know, Sam Harris is an enormous cultural figure. I think that's a big reason why we're here today is because there are so many people that, uh, you know, have a faith in his cult of personality and sort of uh, have a bit of a hero worship of the guy. And I can see why he's really charismatic. 
really intelligent. I mean, this dude's way smarter than me. Uh, so that's what like sort of, you know, I, I always kind of fall into that pit trap of the appeal to authority, even in myself, you know, like I have to fight my own, like, my own knowledge that that's the wrong way to think about what is right and what is wrong in the world, just because he has a cult following doesn't necessarily mean that he's right. Um, you know, but, and just because he's smart doesn't mean that he's right because you know, this guy, I think a big reason why I have a huge problem with Sam Harris is that he's sort of a cheerleader for intervention in the middle East. Uh, And one could even potentially say that that's, that has a lot to do with his hyper uh, atheistic view which myself, I'm an atheist too. So I'm an atheist and a libertarian. And I find the the intervention that we um, involve ourselves in in the Middle East as one of the most evil things that uh, that we could do in the modern world. And that, that is happening in the modern world. So, you know, I'm conflicted. I, I, I think I appreciate uh, Sam Harris. And I think I've learned a lot from him. But at the same time, he has these really sort of insidious views that he um, sort of portrays as an innocuous and even common sense. Um, So like people like him and Christopher Hitchens, I'm conflicted because I like them. I like a lot of the things they have to say, but they're so disastrously wrong about some very important things. Uh, And I think this is one of them where, you know, um, where, yeah, I mean, throughout his conversation, we and we'll point this out later, but there's there are a lot of places where you can see Sam Harris almost fighting himself strategically, and there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there. But I think just to get down to his guest, um, uh, Chris, he 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 makes a lot of really good points, and I think I I think I gleaned a lot of 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 things from this this interview. And I mean, I think one of the first things that I could say is that. He details at the beginning that uh, people can become radicalized uh, very easily and that it doesn't really have necessarily anything to do with the social status of the family that you came from uh, because he came from a really uh, good family. Um, and and that, uh, it, you know, I think this just to tie it back into the whole foreign intervention thing, I think that he makes an important point that... Um, that yeah you can come from a good family but still be radicalized and there's a lot of people in the middle east who were that way um uh bin laden he was the son of a uh construction kind of oligarch or something like plutocrat like his his family is very rich from the construction industry um i think zawahiri was a a pharmacist or a doctor of some kind i mean these uh, some of the thought leaders in the jihadist movement are they came from uh, from decent backgrounds and are and are intelligent people. So I mean, I think that it just on the pure, uh, you know, trying to figure out how people are radicalized. I think there's this this is a really rich uh, a podcast that podcast that's really rich in insights in that. But as we'll see, I think that um, you know, I think you mentioned this that the pendulum with this guy swung like completely to the to the opposite direction like he talks a lot about conspiracy theories in this episode and it's like in his life you know he was he came up in his adolescence as a neo-nazi and and he had this conspiracy theory that uh that jews and communists are the the big boogeyman and it seems like he didn't really stop being radical he just shifted and pivoted from jews to to like whiteness and maleness Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's really my sort of take on it is I find a lot of value in this and not necessarily value, um, that comes from, uh, from Sam or Chris necessarily anything that their opinion is conveying, but just like what this means and, and that this episode, I think holds up a mirror to the problems that we have right now. And at the very least, I think you could get a lot more from the culture war, um, and learn a lot more from it by listening to this than you ever could watch in CNN or something like that. So I don't know. Uh, what do you think about all that? Uh, yeah, I, I I got a lot out of it. And, you know, as we discussed earlier, we have a, a, a bunch of clips from the episode. And I think maybe we, why don't I just throw one out there and then let's just start talking about it because, um, you know, then I think people can really understand, you know, why I had kind of a visceral response to some of this stuff and 
why I, I think this guy's the pendulum has swung with this guy. I'm not so sure he's changed um, in his in his actual um, personality so much. He's kind of just redirected a lot of his energy that used to go toward, I guess, white nationalism. And now it's kind of just like you said, it's in the opposite direction. But there's still kind of an underlying like angst in this guy where he he's he feels the need to find um, this boogeyman. Uh, and and in in his in the case now it's it's the white male and 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 especially the the racist white male right where it used to be the the Jewish uh, globalists right so uh, speaking of globalists there is one where he starts to mention um, the I guess it's kind of like the mainstreaming of the uh, what he calls white the white supremacist movement how you know it's become a more mainstream thing that regular people are just going down this path now. So um, I'm going to play this one and then we'll go from there. And we, we decided to even take the language and make it more palatable, right? So instead of saying, you know, the global Jewish conspiracy that controls us all, we just started calling it globalization. Uh, and we started saying things like, you know, the liberal media instead of the Jewish media terms that now some people are calling dog whistles. To me, they're a bullhorn. I hear these things, and, and in context, um, I know exactly what's being told when you know they're showing a picture of George Soros's face, who is like enemy number one to the far right. Um, but it has seeped into mainstream society, where I think a lot of people are identifying with some of the same things that that these white supremacists are, but don't know that they're being led down that path. All right. 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 So basically what Chris is trying to say, and I think the biggest thing about this and the biggest thing that bothers me most about this particular uh, segment of audio is that it's almost like hmm, he's he's trying to he's trying to basically by using the negative space, he's saying a lot like there's it, he's he's implying a lot of things that he isn't explicitly saying and. Um, what he's, what he's trying to get at is, and I don't know, this is maybe just me inferring, but I think that he's like pointing towards the top towards like Donald Trump or something like that. When he says these things have gotten into the mainstream. Um, and later on, I'm not sure if this is included in any of our clips. I don't know that it is, but, uh, some of the examples that he gives, uh, other than globalism, which that's, uh, that's a word that he sort of associates with this being an explicitly neo-Nazi invention. Um, and then he, he also later says that affirmative action is a, is another, uh, an, another thing that's, um, it, that, that it, you know, he's basically trying to say that if you believe in these sort of like, you know, really kind of melt toast, uh, conservative things that, that you're being a useful idiot of neo-Nazis. And I think that he's just, it's almost like he's giving too much credit to the, the, the fringe violent movement that he was involved with, you know, it's like, he's just trying to say that they are, it, it goes right back to the whole Jewish conspiracy. Instead of Jews being the ones being the puppet masters and, and playing with their marionettes, he's just saying that it's the Nazis. So, so yeah, I, I, to your point, I don't think his personality has changed. I agree with you. And I think that he's just shifted his focus from, from Jews to white dudes. And, and yeah, I think that that's really, you know, really kind of a dangerous conclusion to come to. And I really, I really wish that, that I really hope that people, when they listen to this could see through that. So, uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts on that clip? Yeah. He's basically just taken, um, like any like standard conservative talking point and turned it into, you know, he, he, like I mentioned it earlier before we started recording, he's projecting a lot of like his insecurities onto this conversation. So someone who is against globalization, which I'm not really, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a free market guy. I, I don't agree with guys like Pat Buchanan when they, they want to, and Trump when they want to be protectionist and they, they don't understand what free trade, uh, the benefits of it. So in that case, I mean, I agree with him, but not for the reasons that he's giving the reasons that he's giving again, like you said, are that like, Oh, well, this is just some insidious, force and it's the 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 force of white supremacy that again are acting as as the puppet masters so you know i think you're on point there and it it basically is just um uh, another another boogeyman you know that that he's found and i don't think 
he uh, he's really understanding that. Well, first of all, again, when you said the affirmative action thing, I'm obviously against affirmative action. I think it does so much harm to the communities that they're trying to help. But you can't make that argument with this guy because he he was he was so damaged by the path that he went down, it seems, that any mention of um, a government program designed to help African-Americans, for example, actually hurting them to him, that's a dog whistle. And it's, it's, and, and a, a, another one he talks about, which I'll play another clip right now is, uh, the Russia stuff. You know, I mean, he, he gets into this, like he, he's obviously like the kind of guy who thinks that Russia is again, another puppet master, uh, along with the white supremacists, uh, kind of in tandem. And they are pulling these strings to, you know, push our country in one way or another. And it's, um, it's very interesting. Let me, let me play that clip for you. If you don't mind, just got to cue it up. Um, sorry, one second. Where is it? Here we go. But yeah, it's, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's so much that Russia is supporting this ideology or if they're just trying to create this movement of discord that they know is our weak spot. Yeah. Frankly, racism in America is something that we've never really dealt with. Every, every society that's faced a genocide, let's say, like slaves or African-Americans did during slave times, have somehow dealt with it, right? They've acknowledged it and they've worked through it. We've never, I don't believe, really acknowledged that we have, have had mm -hmm. that problem in our country. Um, at least not from the top. I mean, I think we, t you know, you go to the South like here and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think we learn about uh, the Civil War a little bit differently than we did in Chicago, right? In Chicago, in the North, y'all were the bad guys, <laughs> right? And to you down here, it was Northern aggression, right? We learn about it differently. So yeah. even in our own country, we're like propagandizing our history. So, okay, so, that's a pretty, pretty packed clip. So um, I guess we'll start off with the Russia thing and then we could lead into the good point that he made at the end with the propagandizing, I would say. But I, again, he's he's coming at it from a totally different, different area. So give me your thoughts on, on that, the Russia part. Well, first of all, um, you know, uh, this is another example of where we could show that Chris <clears throat> has certainly not overcome his conspiratorial tendencies. And this is something that's a trademark of conspiracy theorists. I used to be somewhat of a truther myself, and you could probably consider me a conspiracy theorist of types now. Um, you know, there are a lot of, of areas that I have deep skepticism for within the state and within corporate structures. Uh, so let me just get that out of the way that I'm not wholesale like writing off anybody who would entertain a conspiracy because conspiracies happen all the time. But what I find as dangerous conspiracies are ones that have very nebulous enemies. So he uh, he says in there, he says the, the word they a lot about the Russians. I think this has very disastrous uh, geopolitical co uh, consequences because these people are the ones forming opinions. The people that have the ear of millions and millions of people through podcasts um, I just wish that they would be a little bit more careful with where they're pointing their angst, uh, because I think that this could have uh, this could end in H bombs. And it sounds really like I'm making a conspiratorial jump there. And I am. Um, but what I'm basically saying is that, you know, when they say Russians with this whole Russia gate thing that's happening, and he even says this kind of earlier um, that that. <laughs> he almost has like this hipster sort of air about him about the Russiagate thing. Like he was the OG Russiagator who was talking about Russian influence before any of us were. Um, and, and he says like, uh, you know, he, 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 he infers that these, that the Russians are in this insidious plot to make us all white supremacists and all this stuff. And it's like, he doesn't even stop to entertain the idea that these could just be, like rogue Russians who are doing really creepy shit because what he's talking about, he's talking about like this adult Russian guy, which you, you listeners, you should just listen to this all the way through and listen to him and hear him out completely because um, he's, he's saying that he did some like journalism to find um, like these parents of a girl 
came to him and said that she's been radicalized by this by this boy in Ohio. And he claims that it turned out that this was a Russian man in his 30s who was like getting compromising photos of this young girl who sounds like she was underage. I don't know. I didn't quite catch that from uh, from what he was saying. I, I think he just said yeah, young lady. But um, but anyway, uh, you could just consider that this is, you know, let's just take for give him the benefit of the doubt that this was a Russian man. Um, you know, isn't it completely within the realm of possibility that this is just a creep, you know, that this doesn't have anything to do with any sort of insidious white supremacist, um, uh, plot. And, and furthermore, even if it is, could it not just be Russia's own, uh, version of like what neo-Nazism here is here where they're trying to recruit people? Like it's, and again, with the negative space, they don't make the delineation between Russians and like this Russian government sort of force because it's so much a part of our media that it's almost a given that they're they're trying to conflate uh, Russians with the Russian government. And he even goes on to say that, oh, well, these people are creating uh, tens of thousands of fake accounts. And I have no doubt that that's a thing. Like there's no doubt in my mind that that happens. I know that it does from the corporate level to the troll level. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, I mean, I think that, um, just on that point about Russia, man, that's, you know, uh, to people that might not pay close attention, you could, uh, come to the conclusion that Putin is somehow involved in this. And, and, uh, and yeah, I just want to make the point that I think that that would be folly to fall into that trap so um. i agree you know it's uh i think for people probably around um you know anyone kind of under the age of maybe 40 the russia thing is a lot different and because obviously we didn't live through the cold war really um by the time i was like a conscious individual the ussr had fallen so I don't have this same like fear of Russia that some of the older generations do. And I think the whole Russia narrative is playing toward those who actually lived through the Cold War, lived through the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and kind of had that fear of nuclear um, annihilation throughout their lives, you know? So w when you don't have that um, present fear in your mind, um, I think you can kind of see through some of this stuff. And, and again, like you said, like just because there's some 35 year old white supremacist in Russia who made up a bunch of accounts and is now talking to uh, girls in the, in the United States and radicalizing them toward white supremacy doesn't really mean that Vladimir Putin is paying him to do that. You know, <laughs> the Putin didn't necessarily put him up for the job. And there's there he I mean, I don't know if there was evidence of that. I, I doubt there was, but he certainly didn't present any evidence that the Russian government itself had had anything to do with this. It was just, oh, the Russians, like you said. And the problem with a lot of this stuff, and we'll get we'll see more examples of this as we play more clips, is there is no precision in the wording. There's a lot of generalizing. And of course, to, to a libertarian guy like me or you, um, when you're generalizing like that and you're not talking about the individual in question um, and holding them responsible for whatever it is we're talking about, that, that becomes a real issue. Yeah, and I just want to make sure that the listeners understand me correctly. I, I understand that nowhere in that um, in any of his talk about Russia, the, does he ever imply or even, you know, he doesn't outwardly say or even necessarily tacitly imply that the Russian government had involvement. But like I said, it's just about the negative space, you know? So it's like, yeah, I, I just want to make sure that people understand that I'm not trying to straw man the guy and that I don't necessarily think that he was uh, even trying to point to the Russian government. But like I said, it's all about the negative space. Um, and I believe it, there was a lot of stuff in that clip. He says something about um, how America has never confronted its uh, history of white supremacy. I don't think that could be any further from the truth. I think that America uh, has become very cosmopolitan. And uh, I think the racism is probably only on the margins. Um, and, and even perhaps um, maybe I'm within my own bubble on this because... I've been raised around people who were progressive. Like my mom was a very, uh, I mean, she went to school to be a social worker. I mean, I was raised with the, I was raised 
imbued with these values of uh, sort of colorblindness. That was what was popular in the 90s when I was being raised. And I think that that's a precursor to why I am so receptive to individualism, because there was this sort of like consistently individualistic element to the progressive movement, at least at some point, um, you know, so so, yeah, I just I just call BS. I don't think that white supremacy is anywhere in the mainstream and that we haven't confronted it. I think that we have. And uh, furthermore, he gets to the point of the Civil War, which I don't think anybody really has good takes on. I mean, the Civil War, um, the South seceded over fear of uh, fugitive, the Fugitive Slave Act being um, uh, not being enforced. And, it, you know, it, it was a fear on their part that they're, um, you know, because um, the southeastern states were sort of the hub of um, of North Atlantic slave trade. That's really hard to deny. That was a, an essential part of some of their economy. So, yeah, I mean, the South seceded over slavery, but you cannot tell me that the North waged the war over slavery. It wasn't about that. It was about nationalism. It was about Jingoism. So I don't think that you can really put to, you know, any positions on the extremes of this. And I don't think I'm not convinced that the people in the South necessarily think that, uh, you know, it, it's like he implies that the people in the South are just teaching their children that the, the, the Civil War um, was like just over taxes or something like that. You know, I, I just I'm not buying it. Like, I think the guy's kind of full of it when he's trying to say that there's like this clear dichotomy between the contemporary North and the contemporary South. Um, and I think there's an element to truth to that that he's putting under a microscope is all I'm trying to say. So do you agree with me on that? Yeah, I agree with you. And I would just go further and say that, again, to the original point of, oh, we haven't confronted um the history of racism in this company. It's like, well, number one, uh, you know, again, the, the civil war started, uh, because of the secession, uh, with the slavery stuff. And then six, six or 700,000 men were, uh, killed in that war. So to, to pretend that nothing, nothing was confronted about that is ridiculous. And then of course you have, um, you know, the whole history of the civil rights movement. And then you have, like we mentioned before, you have, uh, policies that I would say go way too far with um, affirmative action and things like that, uh, welfare and housing projects that um, obviously were designed um, to, with good intentions to help out these, these populations that um, had been uh, subjugated in the past and oppressed in the past. Um, but I would say they didn't obviously work. Uh, any libertarian would, would, would say that, but just, just to pretend that, Oh, we've never addressed this stuff. I mean, it's it's just laughable and like the, this is was kind of in the beginning of the conversation maybe the first half hour or so and this is the part where i started to really put my guard up on this guy because i was like you know this guy he's gone from one extreme to another and you know he's i don't think either either one of the positions are correct and just um, just before ahead. we leave the subject of the civil war too i didn't mention and i had meant to um that you know, slavery was um, was a key component of the Civil War, but not in the way that we usually talk about it. It was conscription. There was a slavery that we don't talk about in the Civil War, and it was about nationalism. It was about enslaving individuals for the sake of holding together this union. So to say that the Civil War was to combat slavery, quite the opposite. It was a precedent set for slavery in the militant sense. So in my opinion, I think that it's disastrous to view uh, the Civil War with such a just such a black and white and terribly uh, historically inaccurate interpretation. I mean, even like if you pick up a Civil War book from any of the actual uh, historians on this, even mainstream historians will will come right out and say that the civil war was a lot more complicated than just slavery. And, and yeah, I just wanted to stress that point that conscription was a major component of this. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, uh, that kind of goes back to the idea um, just like that. I think Harris generally has a blind spot for the state. Um, but you know, one thing, there was a grain of truth, which I, I hinted at before at the end of this, which 
he talks about, oh, well, we're prop propagandizing our youth with the education, right? And I, I would say that that's absolutely true in the sense of the state, which is, you know, the obviously the public schools are run by the government. And of course, they um, they they push the narrative of, of the benevolence of the state all the time. They, they would never, um, for example, say that conscription is akin to slavery, even though when you really break it down, it, I mean, it is it is kind of the worst form of slavery because not only are you taking someone and forcing them to do some work against their will, you're forcing them to literally put their bodies um, at risk of of being destroyed for for it. You know, so it's not like, hey, go pick this cotton, which is a horrible injustice, but it's like, hey, go in this field and have bullets flying at you or or uh, get impaled by a bayonet or whatever. You know, so. Well, and and even worse than that, uh, let's say you survive after being conscripted. You just killed a bunch of people, man. Your life's never going to be the same again. You were not only forced to put yourself in danger, but you were forced to kill people. So, I mean, we can't just say that, yeah, that, that, that there is any sort of reasonable double standard that we should hold for conscription versus, um, you know, feudal slavery. So, and serfdom. Absolutely. Anyway, what other clip? What other clips do we have? Because I know we we got a lot of them to get through. We got a lot. So um, there's one that I thought was pretty interesting, where he talks about um, how uh, ISIS is the same uh, or very similar to a white supremacist. So I'm gonna play that, and then we can go off of that one. Um, here we go. From Libya had come to contact me, hmm. or so I thought. To, uh, to set up a meeting between me and Muammar Gaddafi because he wanted to funnel money to American groups who were fighting Jews in America. Uh, so it's just a matter of time, and I've been predicting this for years. I, I believe it's just a matter of time before we see white supremacist groups uh, from Europe and the U.S. starting to work with, uh, with extremists from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, while it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you'd think they'd hate each other, um, they have a common enemy that is greater than their hate for each other. Just gets better and better for the Jews, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm going to have to call some of my friends. We're going to have to turn up the pressure on that Zionist banking conspiracy. <laughs> you know that doesn't exist, right? Check your bank accounts, people. Okay. So at least, you know, uh, there at the end, you can see th this is what made the episode kind of... Uh, you know, fun to listen to. At least there was some there was some pretty witty humor on behalf of Harris. I, I think that is one of his strengths as an entertainer is that he's he's got a clearly good wit and a good sense of humor. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, like you had pointed out uh, before we hit record, the subject of Muammar Gaddafi, he really does uh, just skim over the or so I thought. Once again, negative space. What's there? I mean, I just really want to know because it has, like with the Russia thing, it has really terrible geopolitical um, uh, ramifications if we believe that this is true. Um, because, you know, being that history is written by the winners, I think a lot of people still have the belief that it was a good thing to overthrow Gaddafi because he was a terrible guy. Um, but, you know, in, in some sort of roundabout way, them overthrowing Gaddafi is inadvertently causing this uh, white nationalist problem uh, because with the overthrow of Gaddafi, you had mass influxes of West Africans flooding into Europe. And this is a major cultural problem to have this migrant crisis. When Muammar Gaddafi even said himself that he was the bulwark against this mass immigration, which, you know, uh, the reason people want to flee Africa is, A, there's a lot of scarcity, and there isn't a lot of opportunity, if we're being completely honest. Um, and two, people can't even really own property in a lot of these countries. So the destitute that they're experiencing has a lot to do with restriction from being able to be entrepreneurs and being able to do what humans do best, which is be productive. Um, so anyway, before I get too far onto a tangent, I just want to know a lot more about this meeting because I'm someone that, you know, with a subject like that and such a, an incredibly important, I don't think people realize how important Libya is in what's happening right now. I mean, it, it just how Syria is becoming. I think that a lot of people need to look at some of these places 
and and realize um, that uh, that it has a lot more to do uh, with what's going on than just you know overthrowing bad people. You know, so so yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts there? I'm definitely interested to get more details on on this supposed outreach by by Gaddafi's people because again he goes or so I thought and then he just immediately goes to to this point about oh yeah so that means so I was contacted by them therefore ISIS and white supremacists are now going to get together in the future and start attacking all the Jews and you know it just the implication seemed to be if you really listen to it that it wasn't Gaddafi's people who contacted him. So I just, I, I, I just find it funny that he made that example. And it just, I'm, I am curious to know what it ended up being. It, it might've ended up being an FBI sting for all we know, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. It very well could have been. And then to his point about, you know, uh, white supremacists and Muslims being able to band together for this common cause. That's like saying that socialists and right libertarians can get together. It's not going to happen. Like, I, I mean, maybe you'll find, you know, you've got a little bit of that with like the PKK over in, in ISIS and Turkey, or I mean, uh, in Syria and Turkey, but I mean, yeah, it's not, <laughs> I don't see, uh, you know, just to draw parallels to our own, you know, fighting within political groups, it's not going to happen. <laughs> These people hate each other and I don't see it happening. And he makes it seem like it's a more pernicious and uh, realistic thing that could happen. But yeah, he's full of it. Exactly. Um, so the part the meat of this thing that kind of got me really annoyed was when he starts talking about um, Stefan Molyneux and he starts talking about just the a, a couple alt right figures. He mentions Jordan Peterson and James Damore, and he kind of just takes these guys and puts them in the category of alt right and therefore white supremacists. Um, and all of those guys, I I mean, the alt right is such a nebulous term, so it's it's hard to really talk about it and be precise at the same time. And I've consumed a fair amount of material from Molyneux and, and Peterson. And also I, I followed the James Damore debacle at Google uh, fairly closely. Um, so I just want to play um, a couple clips uh, first on uh, Picciolini's opinion of Molyneux. And then I'm going to play, I'm actually going to play, I got three clips here. So um, let me start with his opinion on Molyneux, and then we'll go from there. But a Molyneux, I mean, he's a dangerous person. He is, he is somebody that is effectively destroying families around mm. the world uh, because he is latching on and, and giving his, you know, his views to these really impressionable young people who now are convinced that every problem in their life is because of their parents or their family. And now they need to, you know, divorce them and, and never ever talk to them again. But then he starts feeding them with, you know, Holocaust denial. And then he starts talking about, you know, uh, white genocide and all these things. So, you know, I think that there's a limit to who, who we decide to give space to mm. and who we don't. Um, Sam, my yes. name is Jordan. I'm from Dallas. I'm probably your biggest black fan you'll ever meet. Uh, sir, you, Christian, you've been, uh, in, in my opinion, unnecessarily hard on the right while ignoring the ills of the left. So when you, when you say things like, oh, you know, people on the, you know, they lean towards far right ideology, you straw men like uh, James Damore was on alt right podcast. Uh, Stefan Molyneux has never been um, a Holocaust denier. I don't know where you got that from. And uh, you said that, uh, I guess, implicitly you're implying that Jordan Peterson is all right, which he's not. So that's a total straw man. So to sit there and say that, do you not see where people might lean right when when they hear the ills of the left? What? Okay. So um, I, I was glad when they finally got to that Q and A at the end that there was actually a, a little bit of pushback on on this guy's demonization of some of these um, right wing figures. Uh, you know, I. Like I said, I listen to Molyneux. Um, I've listened to a lot of his stuff. And of course, I've never seen him talk about Holocaust denial. But I mean, maybe it's possible. I haven't. He has like thousands of episodes. I mean, it's possible that he did. But um, the thing that really annoyed me was not even that comment because I just found it to be kind of absurd. The comment, though, about him breaking up families and stuff. Now, listen, Molyneux is, 
he, he talks a lot about peaceful parenting. That's one of his main things that kind of, I think, started to get him popularity several years back. He doesn't believe in violence toward children in any way. And he, um, he really cares about the, he thinks that, you know, obviously bringing up children in a peaceful way will lead to a more peaceful society because that, because children who experience violence, um, as, as, you know, in their developmental stages, uh, will then utilize violence in, in their lives as adults. So that's kind of the premise I would say of Molyneux's work. And I don't think, um, I don't think that I think uh, he's unfairly maligned because, you know, people call him a cult because he tells people to, uh, I think he calls it defooing, to basically step away from their family of origin if that family of origin has been very abusive toward them as children and if they're not able to rectify the differences when they actually come together and talk about it. So it's he's not just breaking up families so then they can join this Molyneux cult. You know, that's kind of the implication here. And the the real thing is like, hey, Molyneux talks to a lot of people and he and he 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 talks about the abuses that they suffered and he tries to help them to deal with it. And the first thing he says is you got to talk to your family and then you got to go to therapy. And if your family is unwilling to recognize the harm that they've done you with their verbal and physical abuse um, in a lot of these cases, then you might want to think about cutting them out of your lives. And that's kind of, that's really what Molyneux tends to be about. And I think he's just unfairly maligned by a lot of the mainstream community uh, with this issue. Yeah. And I totally agree. I wish I would have thought about this uh, before we started, although we have a lot of clips already, so maybe we wouldn't have had time for this, but I have seen the clip that people always look at as the evidence that Molyneux is a cult leader. And, you know, um, it, it, what he's saying, I think I think it does sound, it sounds pretty bad for his case, I think. But, you know, I think if you don't, if you take it out of context or, or if you take it in context, I don't think it's as insidious as people are saying. And, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you can question Molly's talk tactics, but I think it's I think it's wrong to uh, deduce from that that he's like this um, this like oh I don't know let, name any cult leader. He's not a David Koresh or uh, um, or you know uh, God, I'm trying to think of any of the other ones, Jim Jones or any anything like that. Um, and it, you know what's strange? I hope none of my family's watching this, but. I came, I came from kind of a fucked up family and, um, you know, I haven't disavowed them or anything. I just like moved out of state and haven't really been talking to them a lot because a lot of my family is kind of, um, I don't know. They're, they're not, some of them aren't very constructive, constructive people. And I'm really conflicted about this because I've been imbued with very good values from my mother and, um, you know, from a lot of people in my family. But I think without a, you know, I'm, I was never really a big Molyneux fan. I had never heard him say this kind of stuff, but I came to these, these conclusions on my own. So, I mean, what I'm basically trying to say is, um, you know, I put distance between me and my family because some of the, the relationships that I had were toxic relationships. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing um, to, to just confront the idea that you can still love your family, but recognize that sometimes but there are bad people in the world and sometimes some some of them are in your family and and i think that it's okay to uh for your own love of your own damn self to just get away from toxic relationships and i think that's what molly's getting to if you really actually put in the effort to come to the conversation in a genuine and honest way and listen to what he's trying to say however um just in the essence of fairness i can see how they could come to that conclusion especially if they are predisposed to trying to find flaws uh, with Stefan Molyneux. So, um, I can see it both ways, but I think that that would, uh, coming to that conclusion is, is the wrong conclusion to have. And I think you miss an opportunity to learn from Molyneux and what he's trying to say. Yeah. I mean, like I said, he has thousands of podcast episodes. So if you want to pull out some clips, I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff that he said that might seem a little off if you're, if you're just going by, Oh, here's how evil Stefan Molyneux is. Listen to this clip. And then that's kind of like the only exposure you have. But if you listen to his whole body of work, you know, 
number one, you can't uh, expect someone who has um, tens or twenty or hundreds of thousands of hours of recorded material to never say something that he might then later disavow or might later say, oh, I wish I worded that differently or I was like having a bad day. I had some, I was like uh, pretty angry. So I kind of went, uh, I was a little more militant with like telling this guy he needs to get out of that situation, for example. But overall, the whole body of work, I think you can get a much better idea of what he's all about. And really, he's he is all about kind of the individual. And, you know, just because you have blood ties with someone doesn't mean that, um, you know, you need to have them in your life. You know, you're allowed to disassociate with friends who are who are shitty, for example. So you should be able to disassociate with family members who have caused you harm as well. And I, I so again, you know, I do I do in in fairness understand that hearing some things from Molyneux without getting the whole context of the body of his work can lead you to believe he's you know a nefarious um guy but you know you got to be honest and if you're going to criticize someone like that especially put him on blast in front of hundreds of thousands of people on the internet possibly millions you know you you should do your research uh a little bit, bit more thoroughly i would say um, yeah and I, I think they do have a point that Molyneux he focuses on some pretty questionable topics you know like race and iq uh i'm not so sure that you know the genetics are necessarily causative um i'm i'm convinced that a, a lot of the disparities uh in racial groups and iq is more you know downstream from problems of economic isolation that's that's really where i come down on it and maybe that's just my you know bias as as sort of like you know coming from a progressive background, I'm maybe more, um, you know, more, uh, more attracted to that sort of line of reasoning, because I think that it's what they're talking about. There is some factual data there. And, and that's what, you know, and we'll get to the topic of Charles Murray here in a little bit, but I think that, you know, he made a major contribution in that, you know, this guy, Charles Murray is a libertarian and he's more of a progressive libertarian, perhaps like myself, not as hardcore in the private property department, but um, he's sort of coming from this view that, hey, we should look at this. These, This is the data, right? There is a disparity in IQ between these racial groups. And I think that if you listen to his episode with Sam Harris, especially, you can see him flesh out the idea that it's just like I'm saying that uh, perhaps a big part of this has to do with the way that we treat other people and outgroup each other and economically isolate each other. So I think those are important conversations to have and they miss, you know, people on the left definitely miss this opportunity to, to learn from people who are otherwise uh, making pretty good points. And then, you know, just to jump to the point about Molyneux breaking up families, I don't think you can deny that the social justice warrior sort of uh, phenomenon has done anything any different. I think that that has broken apart families as well. And I don't think that you can have this conversation in an honest way without recognizing that there are a lot of really disastrous groups and tribes that you can get involved with that just because we have a morally slanted view on one side, we tolerate it. So there's a double standard between being converted to some radical ideology on the, on quote unquote, the right, we could consider Molyneux uh, versus somewhere on the left, which is more of a Ta-Nehisi Coates kind of, uh, view of the world, which is really just as disastrous as, you know, I don't even think Molyneux, <laughs> he doesn't compare to ta Coates. Coates. Like, like the disastrous consequences of their ideologies, um, you know, I'd compare, I'd compare him to like a Jared Taylor or a Jared Howe, or, or I mean, ta Coates Coates to a Jared Taylor or Taylor, uh, Jared Howe, because, you know, those, those are the really extreme identity politics, like disastrous, uh, you know, things that we could come to the uh, wrong conclusions with. So um, so I think that there's a definitely a double standard that they don't really talk about. And actually, to their credit, I think they do bring up Ta-Nehisi Coates in this episode and say that, you know, what she's doing is is wrong, too. So, I mean, to their credit, they do bring that up. And, and I just wish that they would also focus on that um, just to juxtapose their um, their ideology there. So, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, because the um, the 
there is there has been a phenomenon uh, in the past couple of years since the the Trump moment that you know people are disassociating with their family on Facebook and stuff just because they they've expressed some support for Trump or even just that they expose some uh, reservations about Hillary Clinton's campaign. So, you know, it, it is, it is almost exactly the same thing. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't criticize one without the other. And it is true that I do think Harris in this whole conversation was better than Picciolini, um, in a lot of these things, because I think Harris takes a more balanced view. I do think he's wrong about a lot of things, but I, I gotta just point out just, just for the sake of clarity that I, I, I do respect Harris's, um, you know, ability to to kind of want to stay away from identity politics. I don't think he goes all the way with it, but at least he he talks about it. Whereas this guy Picciolini has kind of become a social justice warrior in a sense. It's um, it's interesting. Now, as far as the race and IQ stuff that you mentioned, I, from what I could tell, and I I interviewed an alt right guy, or actually I was part of an interview with an alt right guy, a guy who kind of went from being a libertarian to an alt right guy, and in preparation, I was like, listen. Give me the podcasts, give me the media that you're listening to, because I want to listen to it so I know what where you're coming from here, you know, because I didn't want to just go into the conversation like without having any idea. So I listened to a lot of stuff and I read some of the IQ and race stuff. And from what I could tell, basically the jury is still out. And I think part of the reason the jury is still out is because people like Sam Harris, for example, won't talk about it with other people. And you have Molyneux who kind of takes this research and from what I gather, the idea is that IQ, there are differences in the races and, you know, Ashkenazi Jews have the highest IQs, then East Asians, then Europeans, and then Africans and Hispanics are below that. Um, so that's the basic thing. And his, his point is this, that as far as we could tell, there is no way to change IQ very significantly. There are ways to do it. One by um, not hitting your children that will raise the IQ points. You know, there are other ways, um, some educational stuff. But the thing is that um, there's no proof that you can raise IQ and then the next generation will just automatically have a higher IQ. The idea is that it's an evolutionary thing that happened over several hundreds or thousands of generations. And it's not so easy to bring up the IQ of one population um, if they have evolutionary arrived at this level of IQ. And then I think the conclusion really is, so with that in mind, we can't expect certain jobs or certain, um, you know, uh, careers that require very high verbal or spatial IQ to match the population demographics exactly because the average IQs, uh, along these populations aren't, um, aren't compatible. There, there are some that are just average, higher averages than others. But again, I think the jury is still out on this. And I think, um, you know, people just don't talk about it and Molly talks about it. So he's demonized for doing so. And I personally, I would rather him not concentrate on this stuff so much because I would rather, uh, I think it's better to, to talk about empowering individuals rather than, you know, do sometimes Molyneux kind of does get into this thing and, and you do get the feeling like, you know, why are you concentrating on this so much? You know, it's, it doesn't see, but, but then again, he's the only guy talking about it. Nobody else wants to touch it. So it's, it, that kind of leads into another clip that kind of had to do with Molyneux and then generally just had to do with this idea that, that Sam Harris won't talk to Molyneux. And he said, I'm going to play two clips in a row. One about, um, now we talked about Charles Murray before, but Douglas Murray, who is a, an, an English, uh, writer. He wrote a book called The Strange Death of Europe, um, and it was regarding the immigrant crisis, the migrant crisis of from the North Africans and the Middle Easterners going into Europe, changing the culture, how it affects everything. And he was on Molyneux's show, and him and Molyneux got into this race and IQ question. And Harris uh, later talked to Douglas Murray and kind of was telling him, like, no, you shouldn't uh, 
you shouldn't have talked to Molyneux because Molyneux talks to this guy and then this guy talks to this guy. And then it eventually was like six degrees of white supremacy between Molyneux and the guys that he's talked to who they've talked to. So it was very interesting to see on one hand, you'll see Harris talk about wanting to expose ideas, but on the other hand, want not wanting to give people like Molyneux a platform. So I'm going to cue that up right now. As far as Stefan, I mean, this is the problem with how these conversations go. So I saw my friend right. Douglas Murray on Stefan's podcast. And, and forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but this is the only thing I've said about Stefan, I think, on my podcast. Many people have been telling me to, to, to go on his podcast or have him on mine. I see him talking to my friend Douglas Murray, who is a wonderful person and is much maligned for reasons that are totally unfair. But so he's, he's there talking to Stefan. He clearly doesn't really know who Stefan is, and he's just on yet another popular podcast. And at some point in the conversation, Stefan says something that suggests his rather just just say sus it. suspicious <laughs> fascination with racial difference. Like he says something about the IQ, average IQ in African countries, or he says, says something which Douglas clearly never heard before and just, just didn't know what to do with, and he just kind of dodged and moved on, right? So that was the first time I was in watching Stefan. And again, I don't, I don't watch Stefan's podcast, but uh, I've seen you know, many episodes uh, and I've seen him on Rogan and I've heard the rumors about his cultic behavior and all that. But I then saw his Stefan's conversation with Jared Taylor, right? And that was just a glad handing gab fest, right? I mean, they were just, there was no daylight between these guys. They lo each loved the other more. I mean, it was just a bro fest. <laughs> okay, so that's that one. Now, I just want to point out real quick, we're going to link to the YouTube a YouTube video which is this conversation with between Harris and Douglas Murray. And Harris in my opinion, Harris doesn't really uh describe that conversation um accurately here because I get when I listen to that, it's about a 20 minute part of the conversation. I suggest listening to it because I get the feeling that Douglas Murray was like dude, I'll talk to anybody. What the hell are you talking about, Harris? And I think he came out like, to me, looking way better than Harris because Harris is like trying to justify why you shouldn't talk to Molyneux. And, and Murray's like, uh, listen, I had a great conversation with him and, you know, I'll talk to anybody. I, I don't, I don't care. So I just want to point that out. We'll link to it. Now here's another clip from a little bit later that I think is just kind of contradicts Harris. That's a self-contradiction from Harris, to be honest with you. And he's kind of talking about self-contradiction so it is a little weird but here we go you know my hope for for conversations of of all kinds is that if you take them long enough if, if there's any semblance of a an honest interlocutor on the other side no matter how deranged their their actual views you can find points where they are they're put in conflict with themselves and that is the the most effective challenge i think to a, a person's worldview is that when, when they, you can show them that they're being inconsistent even by their own lights you know it's a it's a reductio ad absurdum all right take it away trey yeah so i mean like you said he he's in a direct contra contradiction with himself there because essentially he is he he said not but 15 minutes earlier that you know that y implying that you should insulate media from these people and not give them a platform uh but then in this clip he's he's saying that there is a lot of value in uh the people who observe a, de a debate and that um that you're not necessarily probably going to change the person's mind that you're debating but you're more doing it for the onlookers and you know i really wish that sam uh would would have more controversial people on his podcast and you know, he has a fair amount of people, I'm sure, that disagree with him. But I think that, um, you know, and maybe this isn't all Harris's fault. Maybe this is partially just because of the way that um, that people, if if he were to have Molyneux on, how many subscribers would he lose? I mean, he has a vested interest in keeping his subscribers, and I'm sure he would get a mass exodus of people simply for bringing Molyneux on. Now, um, I would say that uh, if it were me, I probably would just want to stand on my own merits and be like, well, I'm going to sacrifice that for the sake of, you know, the truth, which he seems to be so invested in, um, in exposing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it sort of calls into question 
perhaps his own self-interest in contradiction with what he knows to be good strategy. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that it would be, and I really wish that, that, yeah, that he could direct his energy in that direction because it, I think it would clear up the air a lot in the sort of intellectual dark web, as it's called, um, with Molyneux and, and perhaps even, you know, uh, even just shine a light on where Molyneux was wrong, because there are a lot of places where I would say that he not, you know, that he at least takes the wrong conclusions from some of the things that he talks about, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, Sam's smarter than me. Molyneux is smarter than me. I would like to see these guys hash it out. So I really wish that the moral outrage would tamp down just a bit so that we could see these guys engage in a rigorous intellectual debate. I agree, man. I, I mean, it's funny too, because we're not the only ones who would like to see that. I mean, a lot of the people in the audience, um, when you're listening to the whole podcast, when the Molyneux comes up several times and the people in the audience are like, yeah, dude, talk to him, talk to him. And some of them are like, talk to him because, Hey, I think you'll destroy Molyneux. And I think other ones are just gen genuinely interested to see how it plays out. But you know, it's, it's just strange that, um, you know, he's willing to have a white supremacist an ex white supremacist, who used to, uh, who, who in the beginning of the show talks about just like beating uh, a, a black guy uh, almost to death, right? He's, but then he won't talk to Molyneux, you know? <laughs> it's like, come on, I understand this guy's reformed and now he's kind of more toward your side. So that's why you're having him on. But, you know, Molyneux, as far as I know, hasn't, uh, you know, almost murdered anybody. So it, it's just interesting. Um, that you wouldn't want to want to talk to him, especially when a lot of your own fans are saying, Hey, please talk to this guy. Please make, please expose this guy's wrongheaded thinking. And he just, he doesn't want to do it. Part of me thinks maybe he's just afraid he's going to look like a fool. And I, I do think Harris is extremely intelligent and he is also extremely level headed when he talks to people. Um, and I think that's a big strength of his, but, uh, Molyneux is real quick on his feet too. He's he's way more theatrical and he does he's very emotional too. So it would be a very interesting back and forth between the two of them, you know? Yeah, we can only hope, man. Um Yeah, so uh I know that we said before we started that we we're going to try to make this 45 minutes, but we still have a lot to flesh out. Let's not worry about time. Let's just get all these ideas out because we're on too much of a roll um to really put a hard stop to it. So, what's our next clip here? Okay, so we, we got a, a group of clips talking about um, identity politics and white culture and kind of like the death of white culture and that kind of stuff. So let me pull. We have a bunch of them, but I'm going to pull up one. Let's see. Here we go. Anytime any white thing happens, you know, they're not allowed to celebrate or there's women's marches and that's OK, but men's marches can't happen. And that would be. You know, right. something, That's because something every different. day in our history it's, it's has been a celebration yeah. towards white males. Yeah. And it's okay to let other people celebrate when, when something happens that they're proud of. It's okay. Well, yep. it's, it, they say that it's the year 2018. Everyone's got you know, equal rights now, and you know, we're all you know, humans. And so like, we're, you know, we should be just yeah. celebrating. Well, I, I, think, I think the ground truth has to be that identity politics is a dead end. I mean okay. So I think um I, I like what Harris says at the end there. And this is why I appreciate Harris more in this conversation than I do Picciolini, because Harris at least seems to understand that identity politics is the wrong way to go. And just because like this this anti-white thing, it becomes an identity politics itself. And it's like we need to now our whole identity has to do with being anti white male and it's 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 just it's it's very strange to me that that you can see that as a logical position to hold you know not to mention i mean um <clears throat> if you look at actually the uh the demographics and pay scale of uh women in their 30s who haven't had children uh in and juxtapose that with men who are in their 30s, either with or without children, uh, women actually in higher uh, management positions in companies actually make more money than than men. So, I mean, you know, it, there are a lot of con conclusions that people draw from data that I think 
otherwise really rational and scientifically minded people may just go down the direction of correlation without causation simply because it, we are saturated with this approved opinion. And the Overton window gets narrowed to this point where you can't even talk about uh, about you know the real world reasons why things are the way that they are. Um, and, and without being maligned as someone who's hateful and bigoted. And it really frustrates me because in some sort of way, I'm sure some people would call me a social justice warrior because I, I, I do value those things. I think most people do um, value some sort of like uh, equality of opportunity and things like that. I think most people hold that as a value. Um, so I think that is just really disingenuous to say that um, that there's just this wholesale uh, protection of white men in our society. And I think, you know, again, he scopes in on something that is a grain of truth and and just makes an entire narrative out of it. Because I, you know, obviously, um, you know, uh, cultures of the past have been more patriarchal and you can draw like a chicken or egg thing, you know, like men are more dominant, have more testosterone. So in a primitive environment, they're going to be the dominant ones in the social hierarchy. Um, and I think one of the things that these people really just detest is part of human nature in that we do have hierarchies. And I mean, yeah, even though I have like this sort of like progressive outlook on the equity of opportunity, I still recognize that some people are going to fall in the bottom and some people are going to fall on the top. And you can think that that's a bad thing all you want and want to minimize that. But we have to recognize that it's a thing. And if you really valued, uh, you know, closing those gaps, I think that we should have these conversations honestly and not just be morally outraged the moment that someone questions a narrative. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if we look at the income disparity of of races in America, yeah, you could say that slavery is has everything to do with it. But when we were being brought up, did any of us ever were we ever introduced to uh, the the ideas that someone like Thomas Sowell or uh, Walter Williams have exposed in that labor unions during the progressive movement is what iso economically isolated black people and Latinos and Asians and even women. So if we are to be honest about the problem, there there is a factor of economic isolation. And then on top of that, the only way that these people were um, were able to survive was on the charity and welfare from the state or um, charitable uh, uh, means, whether it be public or private, right? So, I mean, what does this do? This just makes people dependent and they aren't being self-sufficient. I am very much convinced that the natural tendency of any individual is to be productive unless they're otherwise, you know, sort of taught that they can't be. And I think that that's the major flaw from like, it, it sucks so much because I want to agree with these people. I want to like help them in some way, but they're beyond any sort of rational conversation about how you could solve these problems. Because from our perspective, uh, the market can minimize these problems a lot if we could just let the labor force be open and things like that. But historically, from the economic isolation of, of these communities and the ghettoization of them, uh, we have sort of uh, been our own worst enemy, historically speaking. So yeah, I mean, it's it's just so frustrating to to hear this kind of stuff um, because you you you, you want to get behind the, the goals that they have, right? But they're just so uh, blatantly stuck in their own ways and will shut you down for having a contra contradictory opinion. And they can't even come to it honestly. Like you want to actually solve the problems too, right? Like I don't think either of us want black people or any other sort of minority to have a bad life economically, um, or in any other way. So um, I just wish that people would at least stop um, when I bring these things up or anybody else, at least uh, come to the conversation, honestly, that anyone who's, you know, going back to their affirmative action thing, at least admit that, you know, just because you're against affirmative action doesn't mean that you're against the success of women or minorities. You know what I mean? So, so, and it's just, yeah, Again, Overton window closes and the conversation uh, gets to a place where we're, you know, someone like us, we could have easily went down the alt-right path if we weren't, you know, exposed to some of the the right ideas or, you know, chalk it up to whatever you want. But um, because I, I can I can see how someone would go down that path just because we're not allowed to even have these conversations in honesty. So 
what does it do to people? It just pushes them back into the fringes to where they there are people who actually talk about it. You know what I mean? So, and I'm guilty of this too, right? I mean, I, you've seen me have conversations with people where I just don't want anything to do with the people on this alt right like spectrum because they sort of associate themselves with libertarianism, and I see that as sort of a black eye on our movement because there's like this uh, perception that libertarianism is a pipeline to the alt right, which again. Like most things, there's like a little grain of truth that they just scope in on when the vast majority of libertarians are cosmopolitan and libertine like the rest of America. So, yeah. And yeah, those brand. are those are great points. No, for real. And I I agree. You know, I I wouldn't really care about free market economics if my goal was not to have a better world for for everyone. You know, I, I see injustice in the world. I see systems that are kind of holding people down. I just tend to think it's more the state than it is um, any kind of patriarchy uh, type thing. But it does suck when you have uh, people with our views, uh, libertarians kind of get uh, put in this box where like, you don't care about poor people. You don't care about, um, you know, people who have been oppressed by, by racists or, or whatever. It's like, no, yeah, I do care about it. That's why I'm fucking talking about it. You know, that's why I, I think about this all the time. That's why I care about free market economics. It's not so I can get rich, you know, it's not so I can only help me and my family. Of course, uh, my, my, my motivations are to, um, be successful and live a comfortable life. But if it's, if it was just that I would probably become a guy who just figured out how to rob banks or something, you know, like I I'm interested in a better, more peaceful and uh, more wealthy society for every human being, you know, and that's, that's kind of the, just the, the thing that you brought up very well, you know, like a lot of people kind of demonize us and think that we don't care about those things. And, you know, I, I just think that's, that's just really annoying. And just, it's just, it's just not an argument as well. You know, it really isn't. Um, so I got another clip for uh, kind of along those same lines. Let me throw that on there. Anytime any white thing happens, you know. But when you start, when you start to make people afraid through misinformation that white culture is, is being destroyed, it's not. Let me tell you that. Right, most of the people in power are white males, right? Not secret Jewish, you know, cabals of, of uh, you know, they're using fear rhetoric to, to feel like something's being taken away from people. They're 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 screwing with statistics. I mean, one of the reasons why Dylan Roof walked into that church and murdered those people is because he Googled uh, after the Trayvon Martin incident. He Googled black on white crime statistics and he landed on a website that had this really innocuous name, the Council of Conservative Citizens right? Hmm. A Republican organization. No, they're not. They're a white supremacist organization that put up fake statistics about black on white crime that inflated them tremendously. Right. And he felt compelled to become, you know, to go in and, and punish people because of that. Um, All right, Trey, I know you had, had a, a, a reaction to this one when I played it for you earlier. So why don't you go ahead? Yeah. So <clears throat> my big problem with that one is that you know, and, and this is one of those uh, pieces of audio from the interview that really um, sort of highlights why I distrust uh, Christian uh, Picciolini, because he says, and I didn't actually look up uh, this information source that he said Dylan Roof was uh, exposed to. But when he just says that, oh, no, they're not a Republican organization, they're a white supremacist organization. And just by the fact that he has this this. Uh, a dragnet that he uses to include what is and isn't white supremacy. It just sort of makes me question, well, you know, maybe it was misinformation, but was it really a white supremacist group? You know, it's just, it, again, it just makes me question his integrity, intellectual integrity that he uh, goes to the lengths of saying that, um, you know, anything and everything wrong with uh, the state of affairs in America has to do with this white supremacist, uh, uh, you know, conspiracy. Um, so, so yeah, it just kind of bothers me, but at the same time, I think he, like, there's something to be taken away from his statement there that, um, you know, Dylan Roof, perhaps he was radicalized in some sort of way by this information. Um, and th that's important to talk about. I mean, that's, I, I mean, he did a horrible thing. Um, but then at the same time, history didn't start the day that he looked up 
black on white crime. History started when he was being raised, potentially by pretty terrible people. So, you know, you or I wouldn't just look at those statistics and be, you know, in the snap of a finger uh, going out and shooting up churches or anything. You know what I mean? Like, this is just this is just like blatantly uh, uh, kind of. <laughs> and it's funny. He talks about fear mongering. He's like, uh, you know, basically trying to imply that people it's weird what he does there. He's like talking about how um uh, white supremacy, he's alluding again to it becoming part of this mainstream. Um, and then is sort of like pointing to the top and the leadership in this country as if they are uh, the the puppet masters and all this. But then tacitly, he um, pivots towards this fringe um, website that Dylan got this information from. So what is it? Is it the people who are in charge, the white males in charge who are uh, directing this violence? Or is it a fringe minority of people, which I think is uh, the truth of the matter, that most people aren't just violent criminals who want to go and hurt people who don't look like them. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's important to talk about the Dylan Roof thing, but, um, but yeah, I think you miss an opportunity to learn about the problems with, with violence in our culture if we just deduce from this that uh, fake news is the cause of this. And uh, it sort of ties into what we're talking about with gun rights nowadays, where people just want to point to uh, these superficial sort of reasonings as to why uh, people would be radicalized to go and shoot up a school when we're not talking about uh, the upbringing of the person. I mean, I just read this um, this uh, Miami Herald article about uh, Nicholas Cruz that was, man, it's really tragic. Like a kid was like on the autism spectrum and had all sorts of medications that he was given and things like that. Um, so, I mean, th this, this guy had multiple like mental problems and um, his mom tried as, as she would to give him a normal life. And he was ostracized for being the weird kid. And I don't know what we can do about bullying because, you know, unfortunately it's just sort of part of human nature to want to ostracize the odd one out. Um, it's a really sad thing that we have to confront as humans who are self-aware of our nature and things like that, that, um, you know, cause I experienced bullying as a kid. I can see how, you know, if I wasn't, <laughs> if I were less mentally stable than I was when I was a kid, that I could have potentially been open to that sort of idea because I hated everybody I went to school with. I felt like the teachers didn't help me. I felt like my classmates didn't want me around. And if they did interact with me, it was to jest at me. like. So, man, I can just see I, it's weird to have empathy for someone who goes on a mass shooting, but we have to we have to. And I'm not sort of trying to imply empathy with someone who commits a, a bad like a thing like that, because no matter what caused a person to do it, that's wrong. It's terrible to kill people, especially if they're not hurting you. Um, so. So, yeah, I mean, I think we just have to have an honest, honest conversation about um, why people are prone to violence and. It really is frustrating listening to this episode in that um, there are so many blind spots. And granted, it was only two and a half hours. Uh, but unfortunately, I think these very intelligent people are sort of missing uh, a big part of it. And they're focusing in on, um, you know, not looking at the big picture and focusing in on this uh, uh, small phenomenon of white supremacy and this, again, conspiracy theory uh, surrounding it. So, yeah, I think it's uh, some dangerous conclusions that they come to in that clip. Yeah. And, you know, uh, with the, the Nicholas Cruz thing, it, it's even more than that than than what you mentioned. I mean, he number one, he was adopted. So he had like uh, not not a traditional upbringing from there. From all accounts, his mother was was a was a decent, decent human being, um, not from all accounts, but from from many accounts. But the other thing was she she died, I think, like pretty recently. So he was going through um, dealing with the death of the only person that was taking care of him. And on top of that, I think um, over the past like seven years or so, the police in one way or another had been called to the kid's house um, like over 30 times in like seven years. So you know, there was a lot going on there. So uh, like to go to the gun rights thing, you know, people, People are pointing to the gun, but there's so much in this guy's history that, you know, the day before the shooting, 
you can very easily say, oh, I'm, I'm very empathetic toward this kid. You know, once he does the shooting, then you become kind of an evil person when you try to show some empathy. But, you know, before the day before the shooting, I mean, the kid was bullied. The kid had a very kind of difficult upbringing. Um, you know, there was police coming in and out. I mean, so again, like, I'm not sure how good of a, a person his mother was. I've heard good things, but then you look at all those facts and you're like, well, what, what, what contributed to this? And clearly a lot of, uh, stuff throughout his life contributed to him making this horrific decision and, and taking this, this horrible action. So, uh, so yeah, there's that. And then I just want to content, con uh, comment on Picciolini's, just his, his way of arguing things. He gets called out on it by the audience a couple times about Molyneux, about Peterson. And, uh, I think about this issue, he gets called out again, but he's based like, there's a couple times in here when he's just like appealing to authority and he's just appealing to his own authority. He's just like, well, you know, like I went through this, I was a white supremacist. So I know this world. So I know this is a dog whistle when they talk about globalization or I know, um, you know, what not was just in a, this stuff. not just a dog whistle, but a blow horn. <laughs> exactly. So he's he appeals to his own authority as if like, oh, yeah, well, you don't have the experience that I have. So you so you just don't know what you're talking about. And this is kind of like a very leftist thing to do is like you don't understand my truth, you know, <laughs> like my and like my truth is the ultimate truth. Right. So I, I just I find his way of arguing things to be just disingenuous and like again like this would be something that where Molyneux would just be like that's not an argument man it really is not an argument like you can't just say hey I know this because I saw this you know or because I I have this unique experience and therefore um you know you need to listen to me because you didn't have that same experience it's it's just a ridiculous way to argue um I have one more clip uh you want to comment on that or should I just play the clip no go ahead all right, it's uh, it's another clip in the same realm of conversation. So here we go. At white guilt is basically a, a a white person's creation, right? This whole idea we have a lot to be to feel guilty about, right? But white people have created this idea of oh, people are making us feel white guilt. No, we need to empower people through our privilege and acknowledge the fact that we have privilege because there are people who are Americans who are fellow citizens that have no access to opportunity okay so oh I'm so angry right now I don't know I want to say <laughs> no we uh, we should feel guilty for some of the things that we've done but again we cannot generalize and say that everything that white people have done to contribute to history is bad it's not true. I mean, we just like other cultures have contributed. But the thing with white guilt is we think that we're the only ones that have contributed to, to society and to history. And that is not true. We have that we feel that guilt because we deny other people the right to feel proud of what they've accomplished in life. All right. So I think this clip is like just very telling about Christian as a person. And I, I'm just going to say that and let you take it from there. Yeah, I totally agree. And you had pointed out that, yeah, I mean, it just sort of shows, it holds up a mirror to uh, Chris when um, when he's, he's in the middle of the conversation and he acknowledges that he's getting filled with rage. And uh, to your point earlier, I mean, yeah, it kind of shows that he's just shifted his blame rather than a fundamental part of how he interprets the world. The uh, the archetype is still the same, but it's just been replaced with different values in the algorithm, you know? So, um, so there's that, I mean, there's a lot in that clip that's, that's, uh, so important to talk about when he says that, um, you know, we're painting with broad brushes here that do a disservice to the problems that we're experiencing as an American culture, as the culture within your own state, uh, or in the, and the culture abroad. Um, in that we are so divisive with each other that we can't be honest with the human problems that we're all experiencing. So if you go to someone who is white, who is poor, and you tell them that they have privilege and they don't have it, this is partially what radicalizes people. And I'm, and I'm afraid that he's missing that point uh, in that he's trying to say that 
you know, it's almost like he's saying, oh, if we, if only we recognize that we have privilege and we lift people up with our privilege, dude, some people, some white people don't have privilege, man. I mean, um, I, I hate to like, uh, focus this inward, but I mean, I was raised without a dad and in a sort of poor family, things like that. So when you told, so when someone tells me that the only reason why I'm successful is because I'm white and I'm a male, it just really, you know, nothing can drive someone to feel ostracized more than telling them that they're, that they're, uh, the efforts that they put in are invalid. So, I mean, I've overcome, I dropped out of high school, man. I had pretty bad binge alcoholic problem when I was younger. I did a lot of hard drugs and you know what? I overcame all that shit and I went to school to be a tradesman and I'm making, uh, and I'm successful now, you know, like I'm able to support myself and people still to this day, when I say, Hey man, I like did this and you know, people can do it. Um, but it still just comes down to my identity as this focal point of, of uh, how I was able to leverage power in society when I don't think that that's the truth, man. I went into debt and I took a risk. Like I went and and it wasn't just like my own ingenuity. Perhaps I'm just lucky and I have a brain where I could like do that. And I got, I fuck man, I got lucky in some of the stuff that I did. But I have a major skepticism when someone tells me that that's all just because of my, uh, my sex, gender, uh, and race. Uh, so I just resent that so much. And um, like I said earlier, I can see how someone could get radicalized on that path um, if if this is the narrative, if this is the approved opinion. Um, so yeah, perhaps you pull people in with this white guilt narrative. And you could even potentially, let's just give people the benefit of the doubt that this this narrative could have an effect on people's attitudes, the way that they treat other black people, or I mean, other people of different races uh, and different creeds and things like that. And that's great. That's the, you know, I, I'm totally in line with that. But at the same time, I think we have to admit that the the constant shaming and invalidation is sort of part of what radicalizes people. So that's my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great, man. And I, I don't have, um, quite the same story, but I guess a similar conclusion because um, I was raised in a, you know, working class family. My, my, my parents were together. They still are. Um, you know, it was, it was a very good upbringing, but when, but my parents were um, being working class, they, they didn't have a, a lot of financial literacy. Right. So when and I did very well in through throughout elementary and high school. I had really high grades. So I was kind of, it was assumed, oh, you're going to go to college. You're going to, but we had no money to do it. Right. So instead of, um, you know, kind of making a financially prudent decision and going to a local college, whatever, I went to a out of state school, um, because I wanted that college experience, quote unquote, right? But I ended up having, you know, over a hundred grand in debt when I came out of it. And my parents, like I said, that they didn't have uh, the best financial situation. So they couldn't contribute much to my college education. So I'm still dealing with a lot of that debt. Now, I had a great upbringing, everything was good, but there was that one bad decision. And then now I, I'm in a hole by, by, I have like a mortgage without having anything to show for it except a piece of paper, right? So, you know, a lot of people's lives is like the luck, like, like the luck of like, there's just like some decisions that in their life can take them from one place to another to another. And someone who you would think, like, oh, you got all the privilege in the world, right? You make one wrong move, now you're way in the hole and like you don't have privilege anymore. But, and this is why you need to treat people as individuals because. Um, not everyone just by, by the grace of God and the color of their skin automatically is in a better situation than you. I know a lot of poor people, right? Like, uh, cause I, I work it, I'm, I'm a blue collar guy. I work in, in that kind of stuff. So I know a lot of people who, um, come from a, a, a worse situation than I did, but they don't have any debt. Right. So, so it's like they, they don't have to work themselves out of like a mortgage, but I do. And I'm not trying to make this like, Oh, woe is me type thing. I'm just trying to point out that is a, it's, it's all about, it's not privilege is not really a thing. It's, it's kind of like wherever you end up has to do with 
the luck of your birth and then the decisions that you make afterward. And right now I, I started a business and I'm working my way out of it, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to be where I'm at and I'm happy to be where I'm going. But, you know, I, I had to deal with some stuff that, you know, on the surface, no one would really think that that was a big deal or they wouldn't, they wouldn't think, Oh, this guy had a, had a couple hurdles in his way. Right. They would just say, Oh, he's a white, white guy. He's got to be the most privileged person in the world, person in the world. And it's, it's clearly not that way. You know, I think it's just, and, and it goes back to a point you made earlier too, which is like, you're not going to eradicate inequality because people are going to, you could start someone off at the exact same position as the guy next to him. And it's who they encounter, the decisions they make that are going to um, essentially be uh, the reason that they end up where they end up at the end. So, you know, when you play this um, this privilege narrative, you're really just missing the point of the individual and the experiences that individual is going to have throughout his life or her life. Yeah, and uh, just you know, reflecting on the uh, both of our uh, anecdotes here. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to uh, have a pity party here or anything like that. I mean, um, I, I, you've heard a lot of bad things about my upbringing and my family or things like that. But in all actuality, you know, I was loved as a kid and stuff like that. So maybe I do have some advantage, um, you know, that that perhaps some other kids don't. But I don't think we should feel bad about having been read to as kids or having actually had our parents love us as kids when it's almost like some people say that that's bad, that we should all be equally miserable or something like that. You know what I mean? I don't think that's what they really say. You know, uh, that's not really what they want, but it's, you could almost draw the conclusion that that's what they're trying to get at. And there are some people on the hard left who almost probably wouldn't be so against that as long as we are all equally miserable, uh, economically speaking, that, uh, that that would be an egalitarian win. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you brought up something that I hadn't really thought of, which is, um, that who goes into the most, uh, highest college debt in this country? It's white people, man. I mean, white people are the ones that are going to universities and things like that. So what's privileged about going into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to have a degree that, you know, uh, means little to nothing to some employers. Uh, all that degree does is, is if you've listened to Brian Kaplan, uh, recently, he came out with a book called, uh, uh, what is he? It's, it's a provocative title. Uh, the case against education, I think is what he says is the title of the book. And basically his whole point is that the, the, the degree is mostly, uh, the value of the degree is a signaling to employers that you are responsible and competent and you can get through four to six years of college. Uh, so that must mean ipso facto that you are going to be a asset to the company. Um, whereas basically what he kind of comes down to is, Hey, there's like a shortage of labor in these jobs that we're taught aren't valuable. Um, which ironically, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in very little debt from going to college myself and, um, and making out pretty well for myself. And you know what? It's a challenging job. It's, um, it, it can, it presents some real challenges. Um, but, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's more rewarding than having gone and got a liberal arts degree, if, you know, to go and work in some call center or something like that. I mean, <laughs> like when it comes down to it, um, yeah, I think I think we also have to hedge this like white guilt thing um, against uh, the changing world that we're in because we're not in the 1800s anymore, man. Chattel slavery isn't happening in America. And hey, just to get back to this concept of slavery, by the way. I think he was trying to say earlier that every other culture that has had slavery has atoned for it, has atoned for their sins. And this is this is a big thing about this whole thing that I haven't brought up yet, which is these people are allegedly super secular and they're like all about, you know, um, it, Sam Harris, especially is sort of a militant atheist in that they want to devoid themselves of theology. But I'm sorry, but the way that they talk about these things are theological and almost in nature, the way that they interpret their, um, their, their goals. And they're like a Pentecostal preachers, man. That's what they seem like to me. Um, so, so yeah. Um, anyway, uh, not to get diverted from the point I was trying to make, but slavery is still happening in some places and they haven't atoned for it. And historically the place that's been worse with slavery, Africa is still experiencing it. 
going back to Libya and Muammar Gaddafi. We overthrew Gaddafi and now Libya is a, a hub of West African slave trade. So um, I'm sorry, but the ultimate victim group that we are told, the Africans, are still actually practicing slavery and they are making no bones about it. They are openly sla trading slaves. Uh, same in the Middle East. There's a lot of sex slavery going around. Um, so, you know, uh, sex slavery in America too. So, I mean, no, we haven't atoned for slavery throughout the world globally. I mean, I think we're just hyper-focused on our own particular experience, historically speaking, with slavery in America. And like we said earlier, even that's sort of uh, the truth of history is sort of distorted. So, yeah, I mean, just to sort of burst all of that out and vomit, <laughs> word vomit all that, um, I don't know, that just sort of drives home my my thoughts on the uh, the bad take that Chris has. So. Yeah. Well, well, you know, one thing uh, I do get from Molyneux, uh, he says sometimes, which is like, okay, yeah, like slavery, horrible, but you can't blame um, Western capitalism for slavery. Slavery uh, has been a part of the human experience since prehistory, honestly. I mean, this was, you know, tribes attacking tribes and then taking their their women and killing the men or or enslaving them and taking the women as sex slaves. This is something that has been going on for literally the entire history of humanity. And it should be noted, as much as the left wants to demonize uh, white men, Christians, whatever, that it was uh, white Christians ultimately who 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 ended slavery, right? So, you know, it's it, it shouldn't be um, missed that, you know, you're demonizing the people. Okay, yeah, they were involved in slavery and it was awful, but they, they also, a lot of white people ha were a big part of the abolition movement um, movement and, and, and had a big hand in ending this horrible practice, so. Yeah, and um, so this gets me to thinking. Um, the... Uh, you know how Irish people are were traded as, as slaves too, right? Um, so mm -hmm. this actually goes back to the Roman era when um, when Caesar went and conquered the Gaelic uh, tribes uh, in in Europe. Um, so pretty much ever since then, they've been sort of in a caste. Uh, even you know, even as as late as uh, the 1800s in America, when we had Irish immigrants and they were. Uh, either economically ostracized or uh, downright traded as slaves in like the earlier parts of the century um, and in the earlier parts of America's uh, history. So, I mean, this isn't a uh, an exclusively um, white against uh, colored folks uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, reality. There's there's a lot of gray area in between. And these are human problems, man. These aren't like I really, the frustration, one of the big frustrations about this uh, episode was that um, that we're unable to parse the nuance because of this moral outrage as to identity politics, just to circle kind of back around to that and that um, we are missing out on a lot of solutions to very deep and, and, uh, and quite frankly, frightening things about human nature that, um, that I think that we're, we're missing when we uh, just you know, get lazy about how we think about problems. That's really what this is. Um, and it's sort of strange for me to be saying on the one hand, Sam Harris is, um, is like, uh, is like the really smart. He's, he's smarter than me. I've said that a couple of times during this, but at the same time, I mean, the, the guy seems to be missing <laughs> something very crucial about, about this and that it's, uh, perhaps less of an identity thing and more of a human problem. So, yeah. Um, hey, did you catch uh, kind of earlier? He, uh, P uh, Picciolini was talking about uh, that America's, you know, still a white supremacist nation, and that Chicago is still segregated and stuff. Um, and did you catch he he sort of when he's asked he's asked a question about what he should tell uh, black people because this whole thing has been a white guilt shame fest and. And really, the the entire episode was just like a cathartic thing for everybody in that room, um, in that they were just getting high off of the moral superiority of recognizing their own privilege and recognizing that um, that they have an implicit responsibility as uh, being of white skin. 
Um, and, and so someone finally asked him, and this is so important. I really wish that more people would ask these questions. Well, what do you tell black people then? Because you're basically just giving me the narrative that they're helpless. And to us as libertarians and hyper individualists, it's so frustrating because we know that these people want to help themselves. So at the same time that he's talking about how Chicago is incredibly segregated, he's, he's basically trying to say that we shouldn't gentrify. So what is it? What way do you want it? Do you want us to actually go and give advice and help people with our privilege, like he says, or do you want to keep us segregated? I just seriously don't understand what their prescriptions are. And that's one of the things that I really wish they would have talked about more. Granted, again, this was only two and a half hours. There's only so much stuff you can talk about. But I really wish I would have heard a more of the policy prescriptions that when he was a Nazi, he believed in. And two, the policy prescriptions that he uh, would agree with and and want to do now because most of this was just moral preening about cultural problems and not a lot about solutions so um i'm all years on that kind of stuff and i really wish i could hear more of it from these S sjw types because more and more it just seems like a moral outrage and less of a problem solving yeah and and it kind of goes back to kind of that what we said where you know he starts off as a white supremacist and ends up as an sjw and nowhere in there is he really thinking about like what changes do we need to make um what is what is wrong with maybe the structure of society it's uh it starts off with him pointing at the jews you know as the problem and ends off with him pointing as the white supremacist as the problem and really all he's doing is is saying like I have found what is the moral superiority so now I'm going to point and tell you Who's the bad guys? Who's the good guys? But nowhere in there is there any um, is there really any any deep analysis of of how to fix the problems and where they stem from to begin with, you know. Uh, and I I don't have any more clips to put, so I just want to say, um, you know, this guy's doing some good work. I mean, I know we were kind of pretty hard on him in this in this conversation, um, but. It's very clear that he's doing good work. Uh, what he does do, and we didn't even mention this, but I think he he kind of is like a counselor and he talks to guys trying to get them out of this white supremacist mentality. And I think that's great. And I think he's had some success with it. Um, you know, but at the same time, he's he he does mention at some point, he's like, Oh yeah, I used to do work for the State Department, but once Trump got in, they don't call me anymore. You know, like now, now the State Department doesn't call me. So now he's implying again that like, oh, the white supremacists are pulling the strings up top. And now, uh, whereas I used to be, um, you know, helping people through the government, now the government is run by, you know, a, a white supremacist sympathizer in Donald Trump. Right. And that has somehow affected his employment, which I find to be dubious. But, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't quite catch that, uh, but that's really interesting because you almost wonder, like, you know, it, what if it, I think more than anything, when things like that happen with changes of regimes, it's just that um, when the exchange of power happens, a lot of people get laid off. I mean, that's just what happens every every time the the presidency is changed. I mean, this could have happened to him in a different era. This could have happened during the from um, Bush to Obama for you know, all intents and purposes, the same thing could have happened. And you couldn't have said without any, you know, you, you wouldn't have been able to say that it was white supremacy at that point, right? Exactly. <laughs> because it would have been the black president that would have kicked you out. So I don't think it has, I, I, I mean, maybe it does, but uh, I, I'm really skeptical of his implication there. Um, so, so yeah. Um, hey man, we've been going for quite a while and we fleshed out a lot of really important stuff. You know, I always talk about how much the culture war um, sort of frustrates me and angers me. Uh, but obviously I, I like talking about it because this is really important stuff to me. Um, so, so yeah, man, um, just, uh, you know, I think I've sort of exhausted any point that I could make about this. Um, but you know, just before we wrap up here, I think you, you mentioned something that I, we probably should have focused a little bit more on the good thing about Pucciolini. Cause even though I can, uh, you know, Let's just set aside all the bad and even what I've con considered dangerous takes on the world. Yeah, he is out there converting these people uh, and pulling them out of a really uh, disgusting ideology, collectivist and disgusting ideology. 
Um, so, so yeah, I think it is really worth, uh, uh, noting that, that, yeah, he is adding value. And I think even if I don't agree with anything that he said here, I think I did take away a little bit of, uh, you know, better understanding of, of strategy and how to deal with these problems, um, just in, in a rhetorical sense. So, uh, yeah, just to wrap things up, kind of, uh, what are your closing thoughts, Tony? Closing thoughts, I guess, just summarize that, you know, again, um, I'm glad he's trying to, you know, get people out of that mindset. I just think he's taking them um, to another mindset that is, um, you know, just as dangerous and just in a different way. You know, it's another collectivist ideology. It's a it's again, pointing the blame at something. And my criticism with with uh, this guy, I guess, Picciolini and but but Harris, too, all the time is he's such an open mind. I'm sorry. He's such an open minded person. Uh, to a point. And then it's like, if, if you don't reach the conclusions that he reaches, he, he demonizes you. He tells, he says that um, you're wrongheaded and maybe he won't even talk to you. Like in the case of Molyneux. Right. But the problem with Harris is like, like I said, I think I mentioned it before. He's got these like views on the hierarchies of religions and how damaging they are to people. But he is so in love with the state. He's, I mean, he was a big Hillary Clinton support, supporter for God's sakes. You know, he's so in love with this idea of, of just the state. And he just, he won't even consider that there's problems within the state. I mean, I'm, he'll consider there's problems within, you know, Nazi Germany or, or communist Russia. Right. But as far as our system, he just thinks you got to get the right guys in there and everything will be all good. And that's the problem I always have with Harris is he's just, you could talk about the hierarchy of religion, but the hierarchy of our liberal democracy is not a problem for you, right? There's no, there's no problem that only one, one group has a, has a monopoly of force, for example, you know? So I, that's why I get so annoyed at Harris. And that's why I can't take him so seriously because, you know, he just, he, he just doesn't, doesn't flesh everything out. And, um, you know, have open discussions about all these things. At, at least it seems like he draws certain conclusions for religion, but then he won't take it, take that conclusion and, and do it with the state, you know? Yeah, so exactly. That, and, you know, uh, Harris, you know, for, we've kind of been soft on him, but yeah, he was really smug and really sort of, um, you know, himself, he has a lot of ideological flaws that um, can be really frustrating for someone who, agrees with him on religion. And like you said, just as a complete double standard for the state. So, yeah. Um, so I guess the only thing that we can do is keep uh, engaging in these topics. And uh, for listeners of Subversion, I think I'm going to be doing this a little bit more often where I'm going to take a piece of media and have someone on or even just myself sort of critiquing the um, the wrongheadedness in it and maybe even pointing out uh, where they're right, like we did here today. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, so... And it sort of goes along with uh, the concept of your podcast, Tony, which is to not waste your hate on things that aren't really worth it. Because I think in the in the past on my show, it's been sort of just me venting my frustration about the things that I see in the world. And I think this is a lot more constructive way to do it instead of just vomiting my thoughts out there um, to actually have a, uh, a place to correct first. So uh, anyway, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, as long as you don't have anything else, uh, you want to plug your show for um, for my audience. Uh, I think I've already done so for my own. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for having me on. Um, I know we're going to post this on the Don't Waste Your Hate feed as well, but uh, just to the Subversion listeners, you can find me at don'twasteyourhate.com. It's myself and my co-host Jeff most of the time. We have guests on, and we tend to just have kind of free-form conversations uh, discussing anything from economics to culture, you know, international, local stuff. Um, we're in New Jersey, so sometimes we talk about stuff going on here, but mostly uh, I think even those conversations would be interesting to anyone um, listening because we we are really, the whole theme is, you know, stop wasting your time getting mad at stupid stuff or blaming people who are not to blame. Let's get to the source of the problems and I, I think it's hard to do it in sound bites. You do have to have kind of nuanced, long conversations. Uh, we don't usually go this long, but you know, this conversation just, I mean, there was a lot to go on. So that's why it was this long. And I hope, hope everybody listened to the end because, you know, even though we were uh, hating on Picciolini a lot there, there were some good things that both Harris and Picciolini had to say. 
Um, so, so yeah, uh, don't waste your hate.com is the website and, uh, had a great conversation. Thanks, Trey. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so yeah, thanks listeners and signing off from Minnesota myself and Tony from New Jersey. Thanks for listening. Later. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe on your way out and find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash subversion webcast. days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com.